Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. We'll be uh, starting a workshop here. We have uh, an update from our um, police chief. If I can have the three of you introduce yourselves and then please proceed. Hello, of course, I'm the uh, police chief, David St. Pierre. Good evening, all. I'm the deputy chief, Adam Higgins. Good evening. Uh, Lieutenant Jim Thies, uh, criminal investigations. Okay, so before we get started, um, you know, the introductions are done, and I, I want to hopefully create a dialogue between all of us that if you feel you need to answer any, ask any questions, um, I think we have a wealth of knowledge between the three of us here. Um, I've been here um, this August for 30 years, and I think Adam and Jim are the same at 33 years. So I think we have almost a century of time between the three of us. It doesn't make us perfect, but I think we'll be able to answer the questions that you folks have this evening. Um, we've created a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'll have the Deputy Chief hand you each a packet that we've created. It really has the PowerPoint that we have um, that you're going to see in front of you, so you can kind of look at it in front of you rather than have to break your neck looking behind you. Um, what prompted all of this, uh, it sounds very loud. Um, Thank you. I think was, a, was an article that was put out back in July by Mark LaFlum of the Sun Journal. Thank you. Um, based on a couple incidences that happened locally here in Lewiston and in Auburn. Um, and it was, I, I put a copy of the article in your packet that you have in front of you. And the, it was entitled, Are We Having a Crime Wave in Lewiston and Auburn? Um, when Mark approached us, he wanted me to provide him some, some numbers um, based on what our crime numbers look like and if, you know, whether or not we were actually having a, a spike in crime or if it was merely the perception of the public that, that we were having, uh, you know, a spike in crime. Um, based on those numbers I, I, um, that we gave them, there was many different categories um, all the way down the list and some went up, some went down. Some were concerning to us, some were not so concerning to us. Some were caused by a difference in how we have to police today versus how we policed um, in 2019, let's say, with COVID going on and everything else. Um, so the article wasn't overly favorable, I don't think, for the Twin Cities here in Lewis, uh, Lewiston and Auburn. Um, but some of it is, at, is, is accurate, you know, I mean, is there concern? Do we have a concern of what's going on? Absolutely. As the police department, I can tell you the three people that sit before you here, as well as the men and women of the Lewiston Police Department, um, really do care about this community that they serve. Um, I, I hope many of you had a, have had the opportunity to meet most of our officers. Um, I can tell you they're all great people, and they really do care, and, and as do we here, sitting in front of you. There's no doubt about that, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, I'll just, I'll just open it up. Just give the accolades for the PowerPoint presentation to Lieutenant Thies here on my left who, who put it together. He's got a little bit more um, expertise in the, in the computer than I do, I guess. So again, what, what brought us here really is, is there was an influx in crime, um, some, some th certain things that we really needed to be concerned about and we continue to be concerned about. Some of those that were mentioned in the article before you um, were the Arch, Arch Avenue shooting where if you recall, a woman was shot um, through her door of her apartment. Um, that was not long after followed by a double homicide in Auburn. Um, and then uh, also they mentioned a reporter having been assaulted. Uh, that was never reported to us when it happened, um, though there was a concern because a bunch of juveniles reportedly uh, assaulted a, a reporter that was doing a story in the area of Pine and Howe. Um, so that's where that article came from and then following that is another article there you'll find that's the second one it's called street talk bad vibes in lewiston then and now um, so again it was written by mark laflum he goes on to say how you know there's been problems and lewiston actually has a bad reputation and has for some time um, 
the start of the article or the editorial, I think, is what, it, what he wrote, um, seems a little bit more concerning. And then towards the end, finally, he says, you know, this is not just happening in Lewiston. It's happening all over the, the state of Maine and the country here in the, in the United States. Um, so I'm going to have Jim go through a few calls for service and how, you know, how many calls for service we have. And we'll just go through this. Let's talk numbers. Okay. I, uh, I mean, how, how we gauge crime as in law enforcement, it's, it's governed by the crime rate. And that's, that's a national standard that the, uh, the FBI came up with the system uh, in 1930. So that's how, that's where the barometer is, is, is we judge everything by the crime rate in law enforcement. And um, which is called, uh, and we base those numbers on the Uniform uh, Crime Reporting Program. So just to give you an idea of what those numbers are is that um, the, unif uh, the Uniform Crime Reporting Program is numbers based on um, your most serious crimes, which is your murders, your rapes, your aggravated assaults, robberies, burglaries, larcenies, thefts. Those, uh, and, there, and obviously there's, there's a wide variety of crimes out there, but the reason that they use the most serious crimes is because um, that's what people report. Those, those, those crimes are, are more apt to be reported to the, uh, the police departments rather than your lower level crimes. So that, that's what they use. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, well, how do we come up with the, the crime rate, uh, the number? So basically what the number is, uh, at least here in Lewiston, it's, it's your total number of part one crimes, your total number of property crimes, and then what they do is they multiply that by the months in the year. And we, we do these numbers annually, you know, in December, and I come out with a report that's included in the annual report for the city. And then those numbers are divided by uh, the population. And that's how we come up with the numbers you see here on the screen. And what I did was I, I went back till uh, 2010, and you can kind of see uh, as far as uh, what the crime rates were for the last 12 years. Uh, obviously, in 2012 um, was our highest uh, crime rate at 40.75. And again, that's per 1,000 people uh, as far as part one crime. Uh, or 4,000, yeah. yeah. Um, so 2021 was our last uh, reported crime rate of 18.79. This year, our crime rate is at 20.88, and I only put those numbers till uh, January, or till uh, September. We still have, obviously, another three months to go before the crime rate. But, um, you know, that's based on, uh, I think, our part one crimes uh, for the year, uh, let me go up a couple of slides here. Back or forward? Back uh, forward. Is it 508 uh, compared to last year, 584? 684. Or 684, I'm sorry. My glasses are terrible. Uh, so we anticipate that we're going to be somewhere in the same vicinity for part one crimes, uh, at least uh, anticipation. You know, typically in the fall, uh, you know, crimes go down. No way of predicting that, but we'll see what happens. So, uh, you know, why is, and again, that's, that's, how we, that's how we judge whether there's a spike in crime or not, by our crime rate, not by what's in the paper or what we read on social media. That, this is all perception by who's the victim or, you know, how it gets reported, okay? So we base the numbers on statistics and uh, you know whatever our initiatives in to, uh, to fight these type of crimes. So, and why is it important? Well, with its predictive policing, so we use our crime rate or uh, to uh, you know better analyze where crimes are being committed, how they're being committed, to better understand where to put our resources uh, for you know some of these crimes. Um, it improves com community relations as far as being transparent and how we report our crimes. Uh, transparency is key. Um, we use it for budget, where to allocate our sources and our grants, you know, where we get funding for, say, if we have a rash of, uh, you know, burglaries or shootings or OUIs, you know, we can apply for grants to fight specific types of crimes. Uh, 
you know, as far as, as, far as initiative assessment and, and we come up with our goals, uh, I know the deputy chief sits down, you know, for the, the end of the year and the beginning of the year, a lot of our, our goals and our strategies for the years, for the year, the upcoming year is based on, uh, you know, our part one crimes and, and where we're gonna allocate, whether it's patrol, uh, you know, our special assignment officers and, and various, you know, it also is based on what our needs are year to year. Right. It's also based on what our needs are year to year. Correct. So that that's kind of a, just a roundabout. I mean, they're, they're, the, the formula is a little more complicated, and that, that's the best way I could describe it. We have a crime analyst that, that comes up with those numbers. But, again, that's a, that's a uniform uh, rate through the whole country. So that's how we judge. You know, I could say, well, yeah, there was a spike in 2012. Absolutely. But to say this year that there was a spike in crime, I mean, we, we gauge by the end of the year. I wouldn't say, you know, we certainly have, uh, and the chief can, you know, attest to that, our, our, our former chief. There are some rough patches that we go through. There's no doubt. I mean, we, we, there's, there's, depending on, you know, the, what drugs are coming in, what types of, you know, the guns that are out there. Yeah, there's some rough spots. And there's, you know, there, I think the chief can talk about, he can, we can segue into what's going on around us right now. And I just wanted to say one quick thing. Some of those numbers can pertain to one or two criminals that are uh, out if they're burglarizing a place. They can spike that a lot. One person can. If we haven't caught them and they keep repeating those things, those, those are all like a burglary. Somebody that's doing a lot of burglaries can spike that um, a lot. So that, keep that in mind too. Right, and, and just to, before the chief talks about that, is is take for instance the uh, you know we had a I mean our thefts were up, and I don't have the numbers uh, that we had submitted to the paper earlier this year, but the thefts were up a lot because of the uh, the catalytic converter thefts. Take for instance, I mean we were getting a lot uh, until they put the new law on the books in June. Those numbers have gone way down since then. So right. you know it's just ebbs and flows so I think I also gave you um, a sheet that says calls for co calls for service comparisons so if you look at that that I put all the way back to 2016 and I think the bar graph goes all the way back to 2010 um, but you can see that the numbers for calls for service pretty much remain constant or, or pretty much in the same realm I think in 2020 we have the most that's listed at 50,196 and that can be for any any type of call that we respond to um, you know no matter what it is so we have 31,409 so far and I went to 831 of 22 so August 31st but again I think we project the same estimate as being in the somewhere in the realm of 45,000 to 50,000 calls for service this year which is comparable to to most other years um, our next you know by comparison how do we compare to other departments um, when I was asked to put together you know some facts and figures and um, some information basically like where we stand compared to other departments now certainly I don't have all of their crime numbers um, but what I did is I, I, I took some I just went back and on my phone or you know on a daily basis for the last two or three weeks I've really just jotted down some inc incidences that happened not just in Lewiston but um, one of your papers that you have in front of you says very recent examples of crimes reported by the media in various main towns and cities if you look at that I can tell you like obviously most of you have heard about the the major influx of shootings that's happening right now in Portland Maine um, they have had seven reported shootings in a week and a half um, very serious and, and I don't when I say all these things and, and talk about other departments I certainly don't want to downplay the problems that we have here that's not my intent but it's also to show that we're not alone in, in this community in in, our, in the state of Maine and in the United States for that matter crime is going up um, there is less concern um, by criminals a lot of that has to do with some of the things we'll talk about a little later here in this presentation but um, I, I think they feel more emboldened to commit crimes today than they did perhaps 10 years ago the laws are a little bit less lax um, COVID certainly was a contributing factor with all of this uh, 
you know, a lot of people are, are suffering from a, a variety of issues in their life, um, whether that be substance use disorder, mental health issues that, that they're dealing with, that perhaps they, they got ac exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. Um, we're facing a lot of that and dealing with a lot of that. There's a lot more um, unhoused and homeless people and, you know, that we're dealing with problems there as well. So I urge you to just take a look at all of those very recent examples. And I think the furthest I went back, and I didn't go back very far, I went back to July 18th and I filled the whole first page. Um, so that's going to be some interesting reading for you. There's, there's shootings going on in Gardner, Maine. There's drug arrests going on in Rumford. Uh, there's teenagers getting involved in aggravated assaults in Fairfield, Maine. Uh, pipe bombs in Presque Isle. Uh, drug sweeps in, in Rumford. Uh, Belfast drug investigations where four women were arrested. And, you know, here's, here's one here. Washington County has experienced 10 homicides since the start of 2020. That's Washington County. That's way up north where people think really not much is happening, right? So, you know, and, and remember that we are, in fact, the second largest city in, in the state of Maine, Portland being the first and Bangor being the third. As such, we're also a service community with a lot bigger population. So does that make an excuse for crime and criminal behavior? Absolutely not. Um, but it's going to happen probably more prolifically, maybe, I guess, or noticeably. In, in more often because of the population influx. I've also, on the back of that sheet, put some, some recent examples of other states um, in the United States. Um, as recent as September 8th, Memphis, Tennessee, where four people were just recently killed. Now, what I will point out at this point is that that person that was involved in that um, <laughs> actually, in my opinion, was released way too early. Um, he was released in March after serving 11 months on a three-year sentence for aggravated assault. Um, if he had served his full three-year sentence, he'd still be in prison today, and those four people would still be alive. So, you know, I will talk a little bit later about um, responsibility and consequence and reward and punishment. And, you know, I, I don't think we can arrest our way out of, out of problems, and that's not my intent. I think I've sat before you many times and told you that I'm not a proponent of locking people up and throwing away the key. That's not, that's not me as a police chief. You know, I believe in second chances. I believe in helping people the best I can without throwing them in the, in the slammer, so to speak. Um, the next page that you look at that I provided for you, um, did you wanna, could you provide them with that? I'm sorry, I don't think I passed. Any paperwork to you folks to look at? Yeah, oh, you did, okay. <laughs> Perfect. Sorry, sorry for doubting you. <laughs> so the next, uh, the next paper, I, I just out of interest saw this one, crime continues to decrease in Maine for the ninth consecutive year. I thought that was a pretty interesting um, fact put out by Shannon Moss and, and Catherine England from the Maine State Police. And that was put out less than a year ago in November, but it basically says that um, Maine is a very safe place to live, and that includes Lewiston. Um, going to the next. Yeah. Feel free to jump in at any time. Seriously, I would. We'd love to hear any questions or or anything that you might have. I just ran the numbers uh, for the year, uh, and again, I'm comparing it in the same time frame last year, just to show that uh, is where we are at for arrests and summonses. Um, Pretty standard, at least from January till September, as far as arrests, maybe we're up by 4.6%. Uh, um, summonses have increased by 21%. And, you know, there's real no theory or on why that happens. It's just we, we have, a, uh, uh, you know, a couple of programs that we've been doing that may contribute to why the summonses are a little bit higher. But, uh, you know, come the end of the year, these, these numbers may even out. We'll see. We're actually at, uh, yeah, this year uh, we're at 704 arrests, again, which is a 4% increase from this time last year. And then the summonses are up uh, about 21%. And that might, a, 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 a lot of that is due to COVID uh, okay. not being able to arrest because the jail's full. And now we're starting to be able to arrest people and bring them to jail. So some of that, those numbers are because of the increase from last year. Uh, where you really weren't allowed to bring very few people to jail due to COVID. So we ended up giving summonses then, but not uh, an arrest where 
we, uh, we could actually put somebody in jail. So that's a reason for that. Correct. And, and like the chief said, you know, our intent is not to go out and arrest everyone for violating the law. I mean, there are certain uh, some strategies that we're putting in place as far as the project support you, and I think we'll talk about that later, that we're at least trying to get these people the help they need and give them every opportunity to do something uh, other than be arrested uh, as far as, and then, you know, the ultimate goal is to, to, to have these people not commit crimes, so maybe we'll, we'll issue them summonses instead, so. But we are faced, obviously, with some type, some challenges out there that maybe are unique to this area, or at least you, unique to society now. So we've listed uh, several different challenges. We'll talk a little bit about each briefly. Um, retention and recruitment, um, just to give you an idea or a picture where we are right now, um, 85 is, is, is total complement, like full, full capacity for the police department. Um, as you know, we're down to 85 sworn officers. 85 sworn, yes, is, is, is full staffing. So 83 is where we're at because we froze two positions. Um, but right now, we're if going on the 85 number, we're at 77 currently, which makes us eight officers down. Or if you go by the model that we're at right now with the two frozen positions, we're at six down. So we're much better today than we were, uh, let's say, a year and a half ago where we had several people out. And I think we got all the way up to the point of 15 or so. 14. 14. So, yeah, former chief says 14. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I think we're doing better there. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes, too, with the academy and um, myself and, and the, the Auburn chief, and um, we're trying to get another satellite academy going with at this time to so we can get more people in the academy and get everybody up to snuff and get the state caught up as well. That's been presented last Thursday to the board of directors of the academy, and now it's moved forward to um, in November that's going to get reviewed by the uh, training committee at the academy. Is it going to happen? I'm very hopeful. I think it could happen but that's to be seen. And if it does, we have currently two officers that are, are hired and working that can't work the road right now, but they are hired and getting paid. So retention and recruitment is, is an issue. We're still having officers go to job fairs, uh, reviewing um, applications on a regular basis, though they're not flowing in. A lot of that's because of public sentiment. Uh, some people just don't want to be a police officer in today's world. There's, um, they're second guest every single day. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult profession where you're working, you know, nights, mornings, evenings, holidays. Um, and it's an admirable profession. I can't say enough for the men and women of the Lewiston Police Department how good they do and, and how, much, uh, how much they take on a regular basis. I think the Portland Police Chief in, in a press conference on Thursday or Friday said it well when he's, he, he just can't believe some of the what, what's given to police officers today, like, you know, they really, no respect whatsoever, they'll actually swear at you, and they, they know there's really not much repercussions because it's difficult to get um, somebody into jail these days. Sometimes it's necessary, not always, but that's where we're at with that. Um, we talk about mental instability, substance use disorder, the influx of the unhoused population. Those are very time-consuming, um, items, all of them. They're all worthy of our assistance and our help. Um, we're, we're police officers, so it's our job to protect and serve, not just to take people to jail. So what we've done, and Jim briefly talked about it, is we, we now have uh, two full-time Project Support You workers that work on a regular basis with the police officers. Most of you know that already. Um, one of them works during the daytime full-time and one of them works in the evening full-time she just started she's a new, she's new to us and she's doing a fantastic job so a lot of times rather than arrest somebody and, and we, we talked about the homeless crisis protocol at one point I think I've mentioned it before so what we try to do is get people the resources they need rather than arrest them um, so we start a PSY call whenever we go to let's say uh, somebody complaining that there's a trespass happening on their property and there's a a homeless encampment that somebody has built the back of their business, for instance. We'll go there, provide a warning, um, ask them if they, can, if they need any resources. 
we'll refer them to a project support you worker. If we've, it doesn't mean we can't arrest somebody if they continue to violate, you know, but we've given them every one of those chances and we document all of them. So, um, and then we get to the point that, okay, this isn't helping, they're not abiding by the law, we have to, we have to make an arrest. Now, interestingly enough, like we just pulled up four different individuals. Uh, the deputy chief was talking about how one person can make a spike in crime or, or create a lot of calls for service. I, I outlined four different people here that have, uh, and I won't say the names or anything, but 34 pages of involvements with us, 41 pages of involvements, 34 pages of involvements, 14 pages of involvements, just one person. And most of those are all criminal trespass, de minimis crimes that really affect the quality of life of, of people of the community here, whether it be indecent conduct for you know urinating or defecating in, in the public, um, using drugs, you know, outwardly, um, without any repercussions, um, all of those things. Trespass is is a, is a big one. Public drinking, and all of those incidentally are are the crimes that are listed as those that we should seek alternative responses for. Um, what else do I have here? So I talk about support mechanisms and, and such, and you know, briefly, I, I feel like I, I really need to, to say this, and, and I firmly believe it, and I think most people are on the same, same level as I am with this. I think if we come back as a society to, and, and use the two basic tenets, you know, and these are, to me, responsibility and consequence, reward and punishment. Um, I think we've so far gotten away from responsibility and consequence and reward and punishment that if we get back to some semblance of that, I think we're gonna do much better. You know, like I said, we realize that we can't arrest ourselves out of a problem. We're the, though, we are, we, though we're the enforcers of the law, we're certainly happy to hold people responsible, but without all the other support entities and systems being in place and doing their part, it does no good. We have to have prosecutors on board. We have to have jails willing to do their job in their part. We need the very citizens negatively impacted by crime to actually call the police and get involved and stay involved, provide a witness statement for perhaps, um, agree to go to court to testify because without that, sometimes we can't prosecute the people. Um, I talk about the jails also, but I, I gotta tell you that the jails have been fantastic as of late. Uh, they've come around considerably. We can now bring people there. Um, they've, they've really made a lot of concessions to make that happen. Um, so. I, you know, basically, we need parents to be parents. We need parents to hold children responsible and accountable for poor and appropriate behavior. And um, I, you know, the responsibilities and punishment from parents is far more important and more successful than anything the police or the juvenile justice system can do, in my mind. You know, so if we get back to that, or if the community takes responsibility, and you know, realizes that there could be consequences to their action, I think we're all the better for it. Um, reward and punishment, you go back to that, that's so basic. You know, like whether you're raising a child, you raise them, you know, if they do a good job, you reward them, right? <laughs> if they do bad or, or act poorly, you punish them. That's the same for, for anything in life, really. I think if you have a job and you do a little bit more than the next person, you're going to get promoted. That's, called, that's a reward. Um, you know, even training a, an animal, for instance, you know, like you, you're, you're training a, a pet dog or something, you know, it's based on reward and punishment. I could go on and on, but uh, I certainly won't. <laughs> but I think everybody gets the point, you know. I, I don't want to be a, a, a police state where, like, everybody fears the law, but in my mind there has to be uh, Some healthy fear. a healthy fear, just like there is a healthy fear of the consequences if you're a child to a parent. You know, I don't want people to be afraid of the police, and we work hard, and we'll talk about a few things that we do when we go far beyond the normal, I think, to do community events and such. Um, that, you know, we want to be there for the people, and we want to be approachable. Uh, where are we, James? Uh, so d dispensable, uh, dispensable complaints. Um, so what I've done here, or actually Jim's done most of it, but we put together a bunch of uh, numbers for parking garage calls for service. This is one of those items that we hear about on a regular basis. In fact, I heard about it just yesterday, uh, excuse me, on Friday there was two complaints about Centerville Parking Garage that there was feces spread through the, through the stairways and, and such. Um, 
Oak Street used to be and continues to be a little bit of an item of contention as far as uh, things happening in the stairwells there, as well as any other uh, parking garage we have. I mean, we have five parking garages, um, and we get through them as much as we possibly can. Like our patrols go through them, through them as, as, as much as possible. I even got a call from a, a city employee here today asking if we still go through the Chestnut Street parking garage because she received a complaint today about that. Um, people are concerned with it, um, and I don't know as a council, you know, what your palate would be for this. However, uh, you know, there's been some talk and some suggestion of perhaps though we can get through these parking garages on a regular basis and we do respond to calls and do property site checks, I'm wondering if we could find the financing for like an ACE security um, to, to enhance what we already have. Um, another couple of eyes and ears, perhaps, um, that might be useful for us. Um, you know, realizing that they're not police officers, but if they could make passes through, I, you know, I think looking at this, the, the parking garages that I would suggest would be um, the Canal Street parking garage, which is the Centerville parking garage, the Oak Street garage, and the Southern Gateway garage. Not to exclude the other two, but those historically have a little bit fewer complaints than the three previous mentioned ones. So the three on the first page that you have in your packet, um, Canal Street, Oak Street, and Southern Gateway would be those that I'm recommending or asking for feedback from you in terms of what, if you, if we could find the money for that and I'd have to talk. That, that would not be f overnight or anything like that. That would probably be, we're looking at maybe something from six or seven in the morning till six at night, just when your um, business folks come in to go to work and park their car, they don't have to um, deal with um, the unhoused uh, that could make them nervous. They may be harmless, but they may, they may make people feel uneasy. Plus, if there's people doing drugs or doing any of those things in there, th th there would be somebody there on a regular basis to deter that, uh, as opposed to us being a little more reactive and, and coming after the fact. Um, so that would be our suggestion, if possible. Would you like me to jump in now? I would love that. <laughs> okay. Um, one thing that, you know, as a follow-up to what the chief was indicating is we have recognized that particularly three of the parking garages tend to uh, get the lion's share of the complaints. Um, and knowing that there's capacity limitations at the police station and do we want to really um, revert our resources of the police department and the officers to doing patrols of the three primary parking garages that we're having difficulties with, which would be Oak Street, Sauntraville, and um, Southern Gateway. Looking at some initial estimates, um, we're talking anywhere between ninety-five dollars and $100,000. And that is to, as um, the deputy chief mentioned, start at 7 o'clock in the morning right before you know, most businesses open, we go through the initial parking garage, we st and patrol it up until six o'clock at night. So especially as daylight savings time is coming up, it provides a little bit more security, a little <coughs> bit uh, more comfort level. It gives us a, the, the city the ability to respond to some of our legacy parking garage card holders that have been there since these garages are construction, uh, constructed or were constructed, um, the ability to feel secure because those are the individuals that ha really have toughed it out through the good times and the bad and that we want to be able to say we're listening and we're responding. Um, the numbers, the preliminary general fund numbers for June 30th are looking really good it would be something that if the council is an amenable to that we would issue an RFP for services um, to respond rather rapidly part of that RFP for services would they would need to demonstrate that they have the employment capacity to staff at that level because again we all know what the current labor market is and then um, do a supplemental appropriation at the council level if that is something that you are interested in and in moving forward. Uh, Council McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do we have a no loitering policy at the parking garages? They are posted. They are posted. Okay, thank you. Councilor Gelanis. So 
understandably, the lion's share is occurring in three of the garages, although, you know, if you look at these calls for service, all five have an increase from 2021 until 2022. Um, I am in complete support of looking into that a little bit more. Um, just to be clear, that 95,000 to 100,000 would be coming from the general fund and not funds from the police. We wouldn't be taking anything away from that's, a, that's an addition. That is a totally new program mm -hmm. and service that we would be bringing online. Right. I would definitely be interested in that. And, and to your point, Councillor, um, one of the things that we would write in the contract that if things are quiet at the other garages as they're passing through them, <coughs> they can most definitely loop through the other two. Yeah. But we want the primary focus to be on those three. Initially. Understood. Yeah. Councilor Harriman. Thank you. So that, that 95 to 100,000 number is uh, the estimate for a year? That's correct. Okay. Thanks. So is that something, if I could get a general thumbs up before we continue the presentation to move forward? Okay, thank you. I would also ask that, um, you know, when we're talking, uh, you know, with companies that respond to the RFP and when we finally get to contract, it'd be nice to see um, uh, reporting. Uh, you know, how many times did they visit each garage, et cetera. This is how I introduce some accountability. Right, and, and there's a whole list of st statistics that I've outlined that I'd like to see captured. So we're on the same page, Mr. Mayor. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Scott, did you have something? I did. Um, just to, for clarification, if we were to do something like that, how much time would that free up with the police department? How often are you going in, or do you estimate how much that would free up? Well, that all depends on how busy the officers are with calls for service, but uh, I'm guessing they're going through there two or three times a, a day, um, each shift, I would say, but it depends on calls for service. There, there could be some days they don't get there at all. So, and, and <coughs> Councillor, if I could add, our building maintenance crew visits each garage at the beginning of their shift too, so there will be okay. savings as well there. I think the whole premise really is is that the more the merrier, so to speak. Like if, if people realize that, listen, we know that A security is coming through here, we know that the Lewiston Police Department is coming through here, and we also know that Lewiston Public Works crew is through here quite frequently, perhaps that alone will deter that from continuing to happen. Um, it may take a month or two for, it to, for us to see any results at all because they're going to they're gonna press them, they're going to try them, they're going to tell them, yeah, right, you know, I'm not leaving and, and so on and so forth. So there still will be calls to the police department because certainly they're, they're a security. They're not police officers. They don't have arrest powers, so they're going to still have to call us from time to time. The, uh, a lot of these people are extremely difficult with us and, and somewhat combative, so they'd be that way with them, which we'd end up going anyways because they're not equipped to handle that, so they'd be calling us. But like you said, hopefully with the fact that this happens a few times, they're going to realize that they just can't get away with it and they'll change their behavior is the goal. Okay, we'll move on, if that's okay, um, to the next screen. So you might ask us, well, what else are we doing, you know, to deter crime and, and um, you know, make things happen, I guess, positively? And Jim's going to talk a little bit about some of the programs that we've initiated ourselves. All right. So this, I mean, going back to well, what are we doing for the perceived spike in crime, but... Uh, this is something that, that we uh, deployed at the beginning of the year. We sit down and, and to do our strategies. Uh, and this is just a few of the things that go on that, uh, that we need, that we believe that addresses some of the, the concerns of the city or the needs of the city. And I know uh, in the criminal investigation division, I have the detectives. What we, we do is we have weekly proactive details, you know, time permitting, depending on the, if these guys are busy with other, uh, some of these part one crimes, is which we work on. Um, so basically, it's, and I have, I have the, the men and women, the detectives in the bureau, be creative to whatever the, the flavor of the day is or uh, uh, whatever it needs addressed. And it could be anything from uh, we target sex offenders, 
uh, performing bail checks, probation checks, uh, field interrogations, or vehicle stops regarding a, a particular hotspot. And I, what I mean by hotspot is meaning a problem area, whether it be drugs or guns or shootings, uh, targeted by either us or uh, any of our special assignment people. And what I mean by special assignment people, we have uh, officers assigned to a, an FBI task force, uh, which is the Safe Streets Initiative, and I can talk more about that in a minute. Uh, we have an officer assigned to ATF. Uh, we have a couple officers at the Main Drug Enforcement Agency. And uh, what is our... We would normally have a selective enforcement team right. that, that we do not have right now due to the manpower issues that we're dealing with. That is in hopes we can uh, get that back up to speed as soon as we get some more people in. But that's kind of a proactive and reactive team that goes out and does anything. Such It could be anywhere from an area that needs some speeding attention, or it can be an area that we're having shootings, that they're going to work guns, they're going to work uh, drugs. Um, uh, prostitution and anything like that those are all items that the selective enforcement team goes and does and that really is very helpful but that unit is down right now just due to we had to put people on the road to answer calls so when that unit comes back it, that'll really help us a lot right and those guys that would work and they, they would work under us in the detective bureau for this select enforcement team would those are more uh, if someone was to call us for whether it would be speeding or whatever it's more of the uh, we're going to react on this now and and you know we we struggled and we talked as as as, as administrative staff we were we going to put people in uh, our community resource team or you know the select enforcement team we we came to the conclusion that at the time probably with summer coming that you know the community resource team was it'd be more advantageous to put guys in there rather it's, it's only you know three people, so to speak, right now. We'd ideally like to have five people there. Uh, doesn't happen right now. So to to meet our goals and strategies for the year, we felt that, uh, you know, putting guys in that in more of a proactive type law enforcement rather than uh, the criminal aspect, which would SCT would be part of that. So I think we want to the next slide. Uh, as an example, and this is just an example of uh, some of the numbers that we uh, um, done, have done this summer. Uh, of course, there was a lot of issues with Kennedy Park. We got a lot of complaints, much like the uh, uh, parking garages. Uh, as far as you know, the drug use, the drug dealing, the alcohol, the smoking in Kennedy Park. Um, it, you know, more or less patrol was getting overrun with complaints during the day. So some of my detectives. Um, went out into the park uh, in, a, in, a, in the month of August to address, simply enough, the, the city ordinance vi the violations that are occurring in the park. Um, again, that's to include the drug dealing, the drug use, the public safety concerns, and some of the numbers that uh, we had uh, came up with, uh, detectives and officers have been monitoring the area of Kenny Park looking for subjects drinking alcohol using drugs in the park, which seems to be the biggest problem. <clears throat> Sorry, do you want to? Uh, and anybody that uh, was found in engaging some of the criminal activities in the park, we were we, at first we gave them a written six-month trespass warning for in Kennedy Park to at least get them out of there. And then, of course, if we went back and they were in violation of this trespass warning, then we would either probably summons and or arrest them. And since August twenty-third. Uh, which is when we started that program. 12 criminal trespass warnings have been issued uh, to habitual offenders of some of the city ordinances we saw. Uh, we issued a couple summonses for actual criminal offenses, which could be drugs or uh, uh, disorderly, and then one arrest. Again, that's only, that's, that's within a month. That's actually a couple, just a couple weeks. Correct. Yeah. Now, so this is, uh, I'm just going to say this is more of a, of a again, a proactive detail where, uh, again, we weren't really addressing a particular crime or area. Uh, from June 6th till June 23rd, uh, we more or less worked with our partners in U.S. Pro in Maine Probation Parole uh, to identify those probation areas who are like high risk offenders. And a lot of these people have conditions that they have to abide by. So we more or less went out to see if they're abiding by these conditions. 
Um, and while we were con conducting these high-risk offender checks, uh, we also uh, armed our officers with basic housing and safety violations to some of these apartment buildings we go into. Uh, I know Chief may have heard of the broken window theory, right? Uh, maybe I don't know if everyone's aware of that. It's a, it's a metaphor to describe uh, no matter the, the how rich a neighborhood is, how poor a neighborhood is, if, if there's one broken window and it goes uh, untended, you know, there's going to be more broken windows, which invites crime, social disorder. So that we use that at the beginning of the year to kind of, um, you know, it, it's been proven. I think it's been around since 1982. I think there's some there's some statistics out there that actually prove that this works. So um, we incorporated that with these checks to go in and, and basically came out with, uh, you know, we they inspected 48 buildings. They noted 158 violations. You know, we're working with the fire department, code enforcement, uh, to you know, again, the broken window theory to see if we can uh, correct some of these issues downtown. We did a lot of domestic violence checks, uh, felony, drug crime checks, probation checks, nine warnings issued, uh, assisted patrol. Again, like the chief said, the more the merrier. If we have detectives out there during uh, um, high calls for service. We have more detectives out there with the patrol guys. Sometimes we on a Friday night we'll have seven guys out there in patrol. So, and then I'll roll out maybe six, seven detectives out there to help these guys. And um, you know, a couple people with charged with various crimes. Now, the uh, one of the other uh, uh, task force officers, we have the uh, Safe Streets Initiative, which uh, I won't get. I mean, again, these are ongoing investigations, which I can't really get into specifics. But basically, we have a, an officer assigned in an, an FBI task force, and we, had, uh, the chief and I, met with. Uh, our partners down in Portland, the FBI, and a couple guys came up from Boston, basically, and, and what they did was they deployed some uh, FBI agents from uh, down south and brought up some intel, and what we did is, uh, you know, we've had some shootings. Again, we went through some rough patches, so we wanted to address that. So during the month of August, we had these people go up, uh, come up here covertly help us out as far as you know some of the areas we're targeting some of the groups and keep in mind it's not like the wild west a lot of these crimes are small pockets and small pockets of people that we're targeting it's not like you know um it's very small so what we do is we target these areas covertly whether it's through vehicle stops uh field interrogations uh surveillance uh to target some of these and just by these, these 30 days with the extra manpower that we got through the FBI, we, we arrested 48 people on state charges, not necessarily to do with uh, some of the crimes, of, just various crimes. Uh, four were charged federally. The drugs we confiscated within this month, where you can see was uh, the 106 grams of crack cocaine, 135 grams of fentanyl. Obviously, you, you know how that is. The methamphetamine, drugs, pills. We took six firearms off the street just uh, in that month alone, with almost uh, eighty-two hundred dollars. Little, actually, it was a little more than that. And that's just through the Safe Streets Initiative with the FBI. I mean, I could go into numbers with uh, our ATF task force. I can go into our main drug enforcement. Again, the numbers are fairly similar. Maybe a little more, less arrests, more drugs confiscated, and actually the firearms that we seized. Uh, just in the uh, the month of August, I think was around maybe close to two dozen, to be honest. I mean, as far as that we took off, whether not necessarily took it away from people and charged them with a crime, but at least got them off the streets and and and, and did our checks with these people. So. Two, two did, did I hear you right? Two thousand firearms uh, took in by your department in the city of Lewiston. Two dozen. Two, two dozen. Yeah, two dozen. Okay, no, two thousand. dozen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you heard 2,000. Yeah. Uh, it was 2,000, yeah. not 2,000, sorry. Two, 24. Yeah. No, okay. No, there, all right. Thank you. Thank sorry. you for that clarification. So it really just goes to show that, you know, in, in our opinion, we're, we're actually, we, we realize that this is happening and, and we don't just sit back and, and watch it happen. We're actually taking initiatives to send people out there to do details, to send officers on proactive patrols. 
Um, I can tell you several of our watch commanders, our lieutenants of the patrol division, are on there, guys, quite regularly. Like, we have, we have cameras all through the city, right? So the, the watch commander will frequently look at problem areas that we might have pan, tilt, zoom, and find some of the issues that are going on, whether it be simply just, um, you know, public drinking and various disorderly behavior that certainly breeds more to follow if you, let it, if, if you allow it to fester. Um, they send out those those people. Um, you, you know, the night watch, particularly uh, Lieutenant K Trevor Campbell, is, is his guys have been fantastic, and he's been fantastic to have them addressing these these concerns. Um, it's not always easy because you know, like I tell you, it, you'd be so surprised at what people actually say to a police officer. You know, it would never that would never happen 15 years ago. I can tell you that. You know, like for various reasons, I just think there was a lot more respect back then than there is now. Um, there was a lot more risk of consequence than there is now. Um, but nonetheless, we're still out there plugging away and doing the best we can. Uh, Councillor Scott. Thank you. Um, the Safe Streets Initiative, is that something that's going to be ongoing or is that just something that was done for a short period of time? And is that like kind of like hot spots that used to be here back? I don't know if you still have that too. Uh, it is. I mean, we do those periodically. The Safe Streets Initiative is, if that's ongoing, that's always going to be here. We're always going to have somebody there. Uh, the Safe Streets Initiative is a fund, uh, federally funded program that they're actually, they do have a, an office here. So those guys are always in this. And, and that, when we actually talked about this, the prior chief, we, we put a guy in there to, and one of the stipulations was that we want them working here uh, in Lewiston specifically. So they actually have an office right here. So they're here for for the duration for however long we have a guy over there they may not send 15 or 20 guys right. at a time doing that 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 that's something that that happens according to what we have going on and the need um but on a regular basis we do have a few people that work on that and if they get enough intelligence that says okay now it's time to bring in uh six or eight or ten other people to work on this for a bit that's what they do okay thank you uh, Councillor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, uh, uh, Councillor Clement. <laughs> there, hopefully they can hear me now. Um, just for the benefit of my colleagues, uh, in talking with the chief here recently, and as most of you know, this was my business for years, uh, by comparison, and I'm not meaning to belittle any other place in Maine, but in the city of Portland thus far this year, they've had 42 shootings. Their police force, Portland is roughly double our population, roughly, give or take. Police force is better than double ours, I believe. And they have 25 vacancies as of today. So we are not alone in that. Uh, Chief mentioned respect, re mentioned fear. That was a saying back in my day that if respect don't get it, a little fear doesn't hurt. Unfortunately, our legislature has done things to remove a lot of respect from our police. The crimes that they're mentioning here, these broken window offenses, drinking in public, uh, uh, public indecency, that sort of thing, are what's known as Class E crimes. The majority of those crimes now, you can arrest for them, but you cannot hold them. You have to release them on, re on their own recognizance or an unsecured bail. And as soon as they get in jail, all they do is say, I, I don't have the money for a bail commissioner. Okay. Bail commissioner has to go and without fee has to release them. The courts have mandated that. So there's no real teeth in a lot of these arrests. Used to be you'd put somebody in there for, for drinking in public. The old story, you, you see the same guy six times in the show. We don't, we don't want to run into you again tonight. You'd run into him, you'd put him away, and he'd stay in jail overnight anyway. Not so anymore. They're out, and within a matter of minutes, they're right back to doing the same thing again. So really, the legislature needs to get involved. Um, we need to get our judiciary involved. We need to get our prosecution involved. A lot of that is going to perhaps happen in November when we have a new election for district attorney. Um, I, for one, am not in favor of a lot of these progressive moves. I think when you lessen the responsibility for these types of activity, uh, you know, you're just letting it run rampant. But I, I applaud these fellows. I, I deal with the Lewiston police on a regular basis. Uh, I get calls 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and they're telling me what's going on, what they've just witnessed and, or what they've just been involved in. 
And these guys put up with a lot of stuff. You can't imagine the stuff they put up with. And the fact that uh, we're keeping as many as we are keeping, I think, is, is phenomenal. I talked with one young fellow here recently. I won't mention his name. He says, you know, I do it because I love it. I love this community. I love the activity. It's exciting. He says, I, I wouldn't be happy anywhere else. Yet we've got others that uh, want to move on because they can make the same or nearly the same money in a much quieter place and not have to do as much, not have to work as much overtime and get burned out the way these guys do. So I, for one, am 100% behind anything we can, as a body, do to support them and move Lewiston forward and out of this disrespectful, dirty Lou mentality that so many people have. I thank you. Uh, Councillor Lachevel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief, Deputy Chief, Lieutenant, thank you for sh showing up this evening. I have a whole bunch of questions for you, and I just can't hold my tongue any longer. Uh, so just addressing, um, have we changed the way we report crimes uh, for, stati for statistics? Uh, has there been any difference from 2005 to 2015 to 2022? Um, uh, we, we see how the government changes unemployment ratios. Well, we're not counting these people any longer. We're not counting these people any longer. Is there, has there been a change in statistics? Well, thank you, Councilor LaChapelle. Uh, not particularly. It, I mean, certainly through times and uh, maybe demographics, they, they, there's subtle changes, but we're, we're governed by the, again, the uniform uh, crime reporting system. So that's standard throughout the whole country. So I would say no, not necessarily. Okay. Um, what kind of effect has these rogue DAs had on the police departments? Um, we, we see in the paper that um, it's close to home, the district attorney in uh, Boston no longer charges for shoplifting. So you can go into your local dro grocery store, steal a box of, um, a, a whole shopping cart of meat and just walk out the door and you can't prosecute them. They're not charging them for it. Uh, if, if I needed a hammer so I could walk into Home Depot, just take the hammer and leave. And these are not getting prosecuted. Are uh, we having the same, well, I know we're having the same issues here in, in Maine. And with these, I'm trying not to be political on it, um, just these DAs that refuse to enforce the law or interpret the law. And I'm going to tie this in with the judges also that are no longer following the law but are trying to legislate from the bench. Uh, how aggravating and can you attribute the spike in crime to the lack of enforcement from that area. Well, I think if you're going to go back to you know what I was talking about of, of, of fear of repercussion, um, I think in that first article I, I talked to the reporter from the Sun and Journal and said people just really don't fear the repercussions because there really is limited compared to what they used to be. Um, I, I wanted to talk about a program called the SCCP, which is the Supervised Community Confinement Program. I don't know if you've heard about it, and this will parlay a little bit into what you're talking about. Um, almost on a weekly basis, I get two or three SCCP requests by probation and parole. And what that is basically is, um, let's say, you know, Michael Smith was charged with a, an aggravated assault um, in a trafficking and drugs charge. He got 10 years in prison was his sentence. Um, all but eight suspended, so now he's got to serve two years, maybe followed by four years of probation. So the sentencing guidelines that he had could have put him in, in jail or prison for 10 years. However, they've suspended those eight years. So how much of a consequence is that person fearing or a rep, uh, repercussion if he goes out and uh, you know does an aggravated assault and, and peddles drugs? you know to our to our young kids so they ask me on a regular basis you know like we want to get this guy out a little bit early on top of that so like it's 10 years but he's all all but eight suspended and he's got two years left to serve so after a year he's petitioning the court to get out a year earlier on supervised community confinement which means he's basically under house arrest but he's out of jail so really now we're talking about the seriousness of the crime he only served one year in jail, maybe. 
and plus the good time and all that. Well, stuff. what he was saying is the eight years were suspended, not not. That's what I. Right. Okay. what I said. Yeah. No. Well, you said, well, it was kind of. Okay. So that pushes the work from the jails onto the police department because you're supposed to be able to monitor this guy or gal that's right. refined. Again, I go back to, like, you know, I, I'm not a proponent of, you know, lock him up, throw away the key, you know, you know, hang him in front of the, you know, the community. I'm not about all that punishment, and I'm really not a firm believer that, you know, imprisoning somebody rehabilitates them, but it certainly has its merit in some ways. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, fear of repercussions, you know, like it goes back to, you know, when you're, when you're a child and if you stole something, you got grounded for a week. You probably didn't steal again because you didn't want to be grounded. So I, I recently had the ability to speak with a gentleman that was just in the paper last week for that, for some situations in, in the city of Lewiston. And they were talking about, um, being on probation and going to probation officer and coming out positive for narcotics in their blood. He said a buddy of his was tested positive 85 times before he was re-violated, 85 times. Um, this gentleman has issues and um, the paper states that he was under the influence when he rammed his vehicle into the back of another vehicle, uh, killing the 60-year-old lady in the back seat. Um, are you finding the difficulties, I'm sure you're seeing the difficulties in the police department, probation, parole, um, are we finding that there's no bite with probation and parole and their hands are tied? I, I, I get frustrated, I think all of us gets frustrated with um, the inability to get something done. And where does it lie? Does it lie that we have to start, as our, our counselor said, should we be talking to the state to start reviewing some of these issues? I think so. Um, do we start pushing some of these liberal DAs that refuse to charge stuff, and it's just sinful how many they refuse to charge? Um, where, what's your thought and your well, some of the reason in defense of these uh, DAs is they have such a backlog because they all uh, stopped working during COVID and the police department didn't. So they're backlogged uh, oh, a so great that, deal. That was their choice to stop working. They I, I can agree with you. Stop working. Uh, yeah, 100%. I, that was I, a political I, move. But some of why they're dismissing stuff is they're so inundated, so it's easier to just to get it off their plate. That's some of it. The, the rest of it is they feel a soft on crime approach is going to work. I personally think it's not working at all. So um, that's what we're facing right now. If, just for an example, I just had one of my sergeants advise me of a person who. Uh, was involved in a murder right here on Knox Street, and he uh, pled to manslaughter. He got, uh, for a sentence, he got a 10-year sentence. Um, he served, uh, they got that, pled that down to nine months in jail uh, and four years probation, minus the time served. He is now going to serve two to three months. This is a manslaughter where he killed the person right here in Lewiston. And we know how... We'll that's how, what he's getting. How big that event there was. There you go. In so if that's what the repercussions are, that's a lot of the problem. So is this from the the state level, or who makes these decisions? This is made by the the judge. Mm -hmm. This is what he pled to. So this was worked out between the attorney general's office or the DA's office and the judges, and this is what they come up with for a punishment for manslaughter. So I have like three more questions, I apologize. Um, how has the, um, the at times negative press uh, manipulate and change stories uh, to make you look bad on purpose or to make Lewiston look bad on purpose? How has that affected the morale of the police department? Well, I can tell you that I look at a lot of different media sources on a daily basis. My day starts at about, <clears throat> excuse me, 5 a.m. with my cell phone in my hand looking at what the Sun Journal is reporting, what 6, 8, 13 is reporting. And I'm all, always concerned when I see something about Lewiston, especially when the information is incorrect. Um, <clears throat> there was a recent case that uh, 
there was a report made, I don't know if you remember the incident, but where a uh, Wyndham police officer came here to pick up two mm -hmm. young ladies that were arrested. We arrested the people on their behalf. They came here, the woman grabbed the officer's gun, the gun went off. Um, I read in the, next pa in the paper that very day that they grabbed a Lewiston police officer's gun and that they actually pulled the pants down of the police officer in the process, which was completely not accurate. So that was something that was reported by, by the news media source and it was not accurate. What that did is not just have an effect on that particular news media source, but all others that reported what that news media source just reported, because they can do that legally. You know, they'll say, like, according to, you know, our partners of, you know, I don't want to use any in particular, but um, this is what they're reporting. So then now the damage is done. Sure, they'll fix it when I call them out of anger and say, look, that's not what really happened. And they, they apologize and then they do a redaction, but who pays attention to the redaction because it was a headline, <coughs> you know, two hours before and it was much more, um, you know. Negative towards the police. Yeah. yeah. So it does impact us negatively, um, to answer your question in short. Um, my mom will even say to me, like, oh, my God, I can't believe what, what I saw I read in the paper. And I said, Mom, that's, that's not exactly what happened. You know, and do I think that reporters go out there and, you know, for the most part, I think most people are pretty... Um, pretty good about it. They don't want to report a lie or a fallacy or, or something that's just overtly untrue, but sometimes they jump the gun to get the story out and it has negative repercussions. They do try to sensationalize the story quite a bit. Well, they're so. in the, that's their business. You know, they want people to read the articles. So that falls into my next question, <clears throat> our burnout rate for our officers that are there. I've had the pleasure of speaking to quite a few of them. Um, one of them looked at me the other day and says, I just want to do my job. And I'm afraid of arresting people anymore. I don't want to do my job. I hide. Something's coming up. Yeah, you kind of look the other way. Uh, because of, uh, number one, the political backlash. Number two, they might have had just about enough of that person calling them a name. And they said something. And now all of a sudden, they said something. They become the bad person. We're only human. I, I witnessed it in front of my store. I witnessed what some of the people were saying to these officers, and um, I couldn't bite my tongue any longer. I had to say something. It, it's just, it is amazing, amazing what your officers today are able to do and to keep their self-control. Uh, so what, what is our burnout ratio, and how is it looking? And I'll follow it up with one last question if you give me the sir. Yes, no, not a problem. And then we'll proceed with the rest of the presentation. Sure. So, you know, I'm sure our officers are getting burned out. Um, you know, I don't want to say we're tired, but, you know, sometimes when you deal with the same people over and over again, it, it does get trying. Sometimes when you're really trying to make a difference out there and nobody appreciates what you're doing, it, it's trying. Um, we're not perfect. We're all human beings. Every one of us, behind the badge that we wear, we're human beings. And when we're not treated as human beings or treated with any respect or dignity that, that I think that we deserve, it becomes difficult. Um, we do a lot, or we try to do a lot. I personally like to you know, communicate with the officers as much as I can, offer them any help or assistance they can. Uh, I urge them that you know, you gotta take some time off. You gotta take a few steps back, recharge your batteries and come back to it. Um, but it, it's a tough profession that we live in, that we, that, you know, that we do on a regular basis. It's, it's, it's very rewarding, but yet very difficult. Um, you know, I can tell you in 30 years I've seen a lot. Um, my next job might be, I don't know, working in a hardware store or something, I'm not sure. But we'll figure that out. Um, but as of right now, we all care. Um, most of us are from this community in some way or another. Um, so my last question would be to follow it up. I wanna bring it right home. Come around the mountain, bring it home. Um, this is not the same council from a few years ago that wanted to fund the police department. Or made statements uh, what can we do as a council that would assist the Lewiston Police Department what is there I, I know we're, we've committed to a new police department itself new a better facility uh, work on better training uh, we're committed to hiring more people is it do we need more money 
for the officers, the rank and file? What can we do to show our support and to rally the support of the community? Uh, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, so how can, tell me how I can help you and what I can do to assist. Well, I think I, I'll thank each and every one of you. I've had many meetings with you, and, and all of you have been supportive, and I, and I truly appreciate that. Um, you know, the, the recent raises that we got um, certainly helped. The fact that we're getting a new police department, the guys are st and, and girls are stoked about it. They're really excited about that. Um, <clears throat> if you show that you, you know, you back them and you respect them, um, I would encourage you, you know, perhaps come in for a ride along, you know, ride along with these, these officers. Um, it'll mean a lot to them. It really will. Um, Sign me up. You know, it doesn't have to be for hours on end. It doesn't have to be in the early three o'clock in the morning or whatever. If you want to come in and ride on a Saturday day or uh, Friday evening, we never know when it's going to be busy, but it'd be an eye opener, I think, for all, each and every one of you to. Uh, I think the mayor's ridden along with a few times. Yes, several. Um, you know, so I'm sure he can tell you some stories, but until you actually see what happens and how p the, the police officers are treated and whatever, um, I think it would go a long way for our officers to have you folks ride along with them. I will definitely second that. Um, we, we do tell our officers that this particular city council that we have right now is supportive of the police department. That's something we very much appreciate, and, and we, we tell that to our officers, and they know it. Um, I have friends that work for other police departments further south than us, um, and it's not that situation at all, and, and they're losing people a lot higher rate than we are. So we do appreciate the fact that you guys do support us, and we do tout that to the officers. But if you did a ride-along with these guys, I think they would really um, appreciate that and, and, and know that you uh, are behind them. That does help. Because these guys are having a difficult time on the street with the uh, lack of repercussions uh, for their actions across the board with our support groups. So we'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, it was, I I've, uh, did several ride alongs at this point. And uh, yeah, it was incredibly eye opening, and I appreciated getting to know um, the officers. Uh, please continue with the presentation. I think we're at uh, Project Support You. Yeah, we're actually getting through it pretty quick here. Well, that, that was a little bit lengthy. However, um, we'll get through the rest of it rather quickly here. Um, I know most of you know already about the Project Support You, so I'll be pretty brief with that. Um, but we do have those two full-time positions as well as the options um, program that rides with us as well. Um, they're fantastic. Um, and we've done a lot with them you know they're they're what what they do is they seek to assist at-risk individuals in a collaborative manner rather than giving way to the adversarial interactions that someone sometimes result from law enforcement led responses so going back to that a lot of times people are not very comfortable talking to a police officer in uniform they'd rather talk to somebody that maybe they seem to be more down to their level they're dressed in casual clothing versus a, a police uniform and I think that's important um, they typically ride with the police all the time so that they do see things and they are available to respond to any type of um, situation where they could possibly provide resources um, and then the officer can actually break away if that person feels safe, you know, to continue the interaction with, with, the, with the person that might be experiencing some kind of wow. mental health issue or, or a substance use disorder or, or what have you. So I think, you know, it's, it's a very important program. Um, you know, and like the Portland police chief just said the other day, I mean, we're still lacking in a lot of ways, and, and Councilor Gelinas can uh, attest to. We, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. Um, we can provide them ideas of resources all we want. We can put a Band-Aid on it for a few minutes, but if we don't have beds that they need to go to, if we don't have uh, treatment facilities that can take them in, then it's, it's all for naught, you know, so to speak, in many ways. Um, so I, I think we're going in the right direction, and this is a good start. It's, it's not an end all, uh, but we're doing a good job with it, I think. 
Um, we, we started this program really, I actually started tracking the project support you, com uh, I say complaints, you'll hear me talk about complaints all the time, but they're really just calls. So we wanted to be able to track them, how many calls that we actually start. Um, and I think we only went to the end of August on this uh, for these numbers here, and we really didn't start till March um, to really track them, and we've already done 216 project support you assists that are documented. This is the number since March? Correct. Yeah. Um, then, of course, we, we talked about the community resource team that we have. Um, they're not the only ones that do community events. <laughs> I can tell you I'm very proud of all of the police officers that get involved in, in whatever activity they do in whatever community realm that they can provide support to. Um, we've listed a bunch of uh, things that we've done here. Um, <clears throat> National Night Out, we obviously do that every year. Coffee with a cop, and, the, and these are just some of the things that we do. I certainly, if I were to list all of them, it would probably take you till about eight or nine o'clock tonight if I was to include every little thing that we do. A lot of officers give of their own time. It's not just the police officers that are assigned to the Crow team, though they do a lot. Um, touch a truck events, I don't know how many we did this year, but there's been several. Um, a big thing is the facilitation of the summer fun and films. Uh, these are the movie nights that we held. I think we only had to cancel one this year. We've had, uh, because of rain, but all of the others were very successful and well attended. Um, these are all things that provide a good um, sense of community and allow the police to intermingle with the community on a level of you know, I guess more friendship than adversarial type of relationship where, you know, maybe an officer stops somebody for a traffic stop. This allows them to actually see that we're actually normal people and, you know, we care and are part of the community. Um, I'll let you read all the rest of them, but the, you know, the back to school concert that we just had it was quite a success here in Kennedy Park. Um, Camp Achieve at the Montello School. I don't want to minimize all the, any of these because they're all very important. Special Olympics is, is, a, is a, a big thing that the Lewiston Police Department takes part in. Um, and I think that's in part for, because of our former chief that's sitting back there. Um, he's instrumental in a lot of that coming to fruition. We have a lot of officers very dedicated to Special Olympics. In fact, some of us are golfing in a tournament tomorrow <laughs> for Special Olympics. Um, National Drug Take Back Days. Uh, we organized a, th the first, a first ever three on three basketball tournament um, out here in Kennedy Park. That was, it, it turned out to be uh, not as good as we expected because of the heat that day. I think it was like 100 degrees, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, World Refugee Day, we participated and attended that. Maine Immigrant Refugee Services, we educated them on the settling of re recent Afghani. Afghan refugees, and the, I mean, the list goes really on. Um, and then we ended with discussion in hopes that if you had any questions, we could certainly. I'd like to just say one thing, just to clarify some of the things that the chief was talking about on the what is the SS, SCCP program. That's when he's getting two or three of these people a week. That um, so the first thing that the chief does is look these people up in our system to see what we have for involvements in them, and many have none. You know what that means? They're not from Lewiston. They just want to come here when they get out of prison after committing these crimes, and a lot of them are major crimes, and they're serving a fraction of what they should be serving for their sentence. And now they want to just put them in Lewiston because they think Lewiston is, uh, has the resources for them. We turn them down. We don't want them. In our opinion, for, for the most part, we don't want to have somebody else's criminal that's getting out of prison and coming to Lewis and Maine. Now, I don't know if they listen to anything that we recommend, but from our standpoint, um, I don't, why would we want to bring in these people that are committing these, you know, drug dealing crimes, uh, aggravated assaults, gun violations, and they're from out of state or out of, out of town and they want to relocate to Lewiston. We do try to combat that by saying that, no thanks, so just, just so you know, from our standpoint, a law enforcement standpoint, we do try to uh, keep those people out of, uh, out of the city. Thank you, uh, Chief, Deputy, and Lieutenant for being here. Um, my question is, so 
you know, you're, you're the experts in public safety. What would be helpful in uh, preventing crime? Uh, are we, you know, is it more project support you uh, staff through uh, uh, Tri County after school programs? What are what are your thoughts on that? Well, what, one of the things that is a very positive impact that I have to give kudos to the, the former Chief O'Malley um, is training. Our officers, if we can send them and have the monies to send them to trainings, that um, not only makes them better officers, but also gets them to rest a little bit and take, if they're gone to a three-day training, they can come back recharged um, mentally, um, and um, and better trained educationally. So th that's a big plus as we try to send them, um, you know, our, our budget was very constrained for a long time and, and our officers were lacking training and that, that's been brought back by Chief O'Malley and now Chief St. Pierre were trying to keep up with that training. But that's one area that um, seems to be working well and we want to continue to train these officers the best we can to handle what's going on out there. I don't think that's the only thing. I mean, you certainly, I listed off a bunch of things. Uh, you know, parents parents uh, taking care of where, you know, their children, raising them appropriately, um, teaching them responsibility, teaching them, you know, how to behave is huge because those kids grow up and then they become those that we have to deal with. Um, so if there was a little bit more parental control, I think that would certainly help us a lot. Uh, we talked about, you know, the courts and how inundated they are. Once that gets a little bit better, I think we'll be in better standing. Um, the jails already have now become much better than they were six months ago, way better than they were a year ago. You know, they're finally taking people when we need to bring them. Again, so this, it's multifaceted. I don't think there's one thing that's going to make this community better. It's a whole host of things that makes it better. The training that the deputy chief talks about is a big thing, um, and so on. Also, legislation and other things like that, that uh, is the soft on crime approach that we're being uh, forced to deal with today. Uh, we're having a very difficult time with that. Councilor Scott. Thank you. Um, I too had several questions and comments. Um, I will say that a lot of it was covered by my fellow councilor, Councilor Rashpel, so I appreciate that. And I will make a quick comment on the piece about legislation. I personally worked for over three and a half years with another woman from Old Orchard Beach and got legislation changed in Augusta that stated that there needed to be a mandatory sentence for those that commit a manslaughter charge crime against children under the age of five. It was a heck of a lot of work, but it needed to be done because personally I had to experience that with my family. The person that got charged actually was in jail for three years and 17 days for taking the life of my two-year-old niece. Um, so there is legislation work that needs to be done and we do need to look at that. Um, but I'd like to go into a couple of other things. First off, this was in a tremendous amount of information and work, and so I, I want to tell you how much I really appreciate that. Um, but I have a couple of questions for you, and I don't want you to take any of this the hard way because my personal opinion is that you need to take the narrative back. You need to take that narrative back and let our community know what's happening, and I think this is a good step in doing that. We need that information out there. So. One of the things that I hear a lot about when we look at these statistics, these statistics don't include numbers like the number of times we hear about shootings happening in our community. Are we tallying those kind of numbers? Because I think that when you talk to community members and you talk about what their per perception is, and we all know that perception is a lot of times more reality than actual reality or facts. And the perception is, is that crime is increasing because they hear about these gunshots, right, and these things happening. And I don't have folks in my neighborhood or people talking about their car being stolen or the fear of their car being stolen. They're fearful of a bullet coming through their door because they hear about these gunshots. So I think that we need to have those conversations, see if we can get numbers, and talk about that, and reassure the community that we are, these are things we are working on. Look at the things that the community is worried about. You know, when we talk about 
our economic development and building and building that strategy. And we look at some of the things that are happening downtown around our businesses, and we look at needles being found in bushes, and we look at um, you know, defecation in different areas of buildings. And I also heard a story this week about a needle being found around the middle school, on the middle school property. You know, where are we at with our, our boxes that collect needles? Are we counting those numbers of how many needles are collected? And are there more being found? Do we need to look at that process and see what's available? Because those perceptions, I think, affect not only what our community thinks, but it also affects possibly economic development and businesses coming in. And I think that all of us here, as Council LaChapelle said, are, we're, you've got a council here that wants to support you. How do we work through all of this to ensure that we are getting that change and we're covering those things that the community is really concerned about? So to answer your question quickly, I do have some numbers and <laughs> I didn't print them out because you'd never read them because I don't know if I'll be able to read them, but we do track all of the needles that we collect. Okay. Um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 sites listed here in Lewiston and they're counted every time that they're emptied. So I, I, I do have those numbers. I'd have to tally them, but we do track such things as that. Um, you know, there's a, it just shows a myriad of things that we're doing, not just one thing. You know, we, we realize this is important. Um, and it, to put them in places strategically, like we've actually put some in one place and then it produced no results. There was no needles found in it um, when it was emptied. So we moved it to another place and then found, okay, in that place maybe it, it was 12 in this week that were found in there. That seems like that's a good place to put that, that, that um, box. needle box. I, 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 we're at a loss of what to say. Sharps. Oh, Sharps container, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we do track all of that, and, and I, I want to say the number this year is like 800 and some odd that are just here. Now, you know, realize obviously we have a drug take back box and a Sharps container in our police department that people utilize on a regular basis. They bring in their unwanted drugs, they also bring in their unwanted or unused or used needles. So those get brought there. In addition to, you know, many people certainly safely discard them, you know, put there's many ways of doing it where you can, you know, pinch off the needle and throw it into a, uh, maybe like a detergent container or something that, that's advertised. But for, to answer your question, we do track all of those numbers. So, and I, I think that that's sort of why I'm, I'm bringing this up. I think we need to talk about it. I think that our community needs to recognize that you are doing this work. Like I said, you need to take back the narrative, in my opinion. You need to tell them what we're doing, what's happening, and how it's happening. You know, when we talk about, when I talk about folks in the Sunnyside neighborhood, their concern is, unfortunately, the homeless situation. They're concerned about people going in their backyard. They're concerned that their security lights come on in the middle of the night. Who's in my backyard, and am I, do I have to worry about this? Is it safe for my kids to be out there? You know, those are the things we need to talk about, and how, as Council LaChapelle said, can we help you to make sure that we're addressing this and, and build up that the community understands it. I think that these, what you call the de minimis, de minimis, de minimis I'm sorry. infractions perhaps yes like the small crimes which yeah. seem like small crimes but you know it's the small crimes that make us look like we're the that stupid word the dirty mm. it is it is when people are talking about seeing somebody drinking a beer in Kennedy Park it's when they're talking about all of these little things those are the things that people are more concerned about. that's where you get all your social media posts that's where you get the newspaper doing their their thing um, and I'll just leave that at that. Um, you know, and that's where we have to be able to address this and we need to have, you know, even officers out there addressing it, having that public view. And also, you know, putting the scare back. I'm sorry, but if I have a police officer behind me, even when it's a police officer I know, I still get the jitters. I don't know why. I haven't done Thank anything you. wrong. <laughs> My right? on while driving a police but car. you know, that is <laughs> effective. It's effective with our kids. It's effective with criminals. It's effective with a lot of people. I think that they need to see that, you know, they're, they're not just going to get away with things. It doesn't matter. We have a shortage at, you know, our jails. We have shortages in our police departments. We have shortages. We need to recruit more people. But the folks that we have here, you need to, you know, you do all these great things, but you also need to be the hard, you know what I mean. And, right, and make people understand that they, it's safe to be in their neighborhood because that's what people are concerned about. They want to feel safe in our community. I'm an avid walker. 
I walk everywhere. I used to, when I was on the school committee, walk from Pettengill Street to the Dingley Building and even walk at 10.30, 11, 12 at night from the Dingley Building back to Pettengill Street. I'll tell you right now, my husband says, absolutely not now that you're on the city council and will you walk? There's no difference between this building and Dingley, in my opinion, to Pettengill Street where I lived but it doesn't feel like it used to back in the day. And those are things that we need to focus on. That's what people that live here the long time are concerned about. We need to have these discussions and bring it up more. I also feel that we need to bring economic development in on this conversation. What are they hearing from new potential businesses coming in? Are they feeling comfortable? Are they seeing, like I saw today, behind a building on Park Street and Bates and where the I think you know where I mean by she doesn't like Guthrie's. There was an encampment there. There's a tent there, and it looks like somebody is living there. That's not conducive for a new business coming in, looking at our downtown and saying, I want to do, I want to build here or put a business there, right? Those are the kind of things, and I, I know that we have that new legislation from Augusta about the homeless situation, mm -hmm. and I fully understand that, but I also think that I don't know, I'm personally of the opinion that the police officer going to them and saying, you need to move along, this is our busy, you know, you just, yeah, I don't know how we do that, but we need to do more. May I? Yes. <laughs> uh, so just today I addressed that to, to several people on, a, on an email, and I certainly encourage any business that, you know, wants to contact us. Um, oh, when it's private property, we can't just really go there and kick somebody off the property without somebody first complaining about them or having it conspicuously posted, no trespassing. Now, you know, I know it, it's, it doesn't look great for, let's say, if you're looking at the, uh, the business district downtown that every building has a no trespassing sign, but that doesn't mean we can't do anything. A lot of times these people are coming into their business in the morning and they're finding somebody sleeping in the alcove of their building. Now. I'm going to send my crow guys and, and, and Ryan Gagnon, our officer that walks the, the, the beat down there, to all the businesses down there. And if we can get them to collectively, you know, they have to basically say that I don't want somebody sleeping in my um, alcove, if you want to call it that. And then we will remove them. But in order to charge somebody for a criminal trespass, um, we have to first warn them by statute. Same thing with a disorderly conduct. You can't just go arrest somebody because they're disorderly or just can't go somebody, arrest somebody because they're trespassing without first warning them. So that's my intention and I put that in an email as, as early as today or as late as today, I should say, in regards to that. So, um, and it was our economic development that reached out to me and how can we better <coughs> do this? So, okay. you know, our city is in fact looking out for, you know, business development and in, 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 the, in the feeling of safety for all the people that are gonna go to those businesses. So I think we're going to look into that, certainly. And if I may, just a little bit more, please. Yeah, please proceed, Councilor. Um, so I appreciate you talking about the training, and the training is needed, because I think that's an important piece. There's a lot of different police departments throughout the country. I've been looking at a lot of different places myself, just doing a little research, and there are a lot of good different programs and, and things that maybe we can use here. Even though we may not be a big city like Los Angeles, they may have some programs that deal with some of the youth, some of the gangs, some of that other stuff that we can use to help. So in, as far as that, I'm, I don't know about others, but I'd be more than willing to help support getting that more training involved for our police department and that sort of thing. I would also like to have maybe a further conversation with you about the youth and the schools, the disciplinary actions, and the need for what you said, that parental, there's, there's gotta be ways to have those conversations or to facilitate those conversations to make sure that parents are understanding what the consequences are and also kids are understanding and that you know these behaviors are not acceptable, they're not okay, they're not gonna happen in our community and there are consequences for doing these sorts of things. We had consequences if you're doing those things. So I, I, I want to encourage doing more of that also and I also would very much love to go on a ride at 3 a.m. I want to see all of that. I, I think it's important and I think it's important that we all see that stuff and see what's really happening out there. Um, we see a lot. I know I see a lot just going around my neighborhood and stuff but I, I'm sure there's a lot that we don't see and I think it would be important for all of us to know all those things and I believe that's all I have for right now. Sorry. Councillor Gelinas. Thank you. Um, 
first off, thank you for this presentation. Um, it was filled with really good information. I share with you, Chief, I had the opportunity at my business yesterday to have to call on the Lewiston police and uh, on a situation that happened with a family. And what struck me was the level of professionalism, the level of attentiveness, but most importantly, the level of compassion that was exhibited by three of the Lewiston police officers, and I was just blown away. I already knew, you know, but what was so cool was that when they departed after about, you know, what seemed like a day, um, you know, a lot of my staff and families were witness to it, really commented on that well as well, and that, that was great. So, um, huge proponent of everything that you're doing, so thank you. I also would support training. I think there's nothing better than that reset opportunity and that opportunity to go out and get that information and feel, re you know, recharged. What I really appreciated most about tonight was just the opportunity that you took to kind of debunk the myths about crime in Lewiston. Because like others have spoken of, you know, there's just so much that's put in the newspapers and on social media. And, you know, I wish in some ways we could formulate a rebuttal of sorts, you know, to really, like you said, change the narrative and, and not make it defensive, but like, can we just talk about the facts? We're not getting our statistics, as you said, sir, from <laughs> Facebook, we're not getting the statistics from the newspaper, you know, we're really, we're getting the st statistics from our own tracking, and I think that is so important, and I just, I just want to spend some time thinking about that, like, what can we do in the form of a rebuttal, because it's up to us, I mean, we can either turn the other cheek, and continue to turn the other cheek, or we can create some type of respectful rebuttal, because it's, it's not okay, and it's, it's not good for our community. Um, the one thing that struck me about this was when you were talking about the arrests, uh, we, we talk about like barriers or limitations on arresting folks because of legislative changes and things like that. Um, you know, our, our, our option now is to get resources to folks as opposed to arresting them. But yet, when you talked about the statistics from January 1 to September 1, or uh, yeah, um, those are actually higher than usual. And I was surprised to hear that there was an increase simply because you would think the opposite intuitively based on what we're hearing, right? You would think that it would be the opposite. And maybe it's because you referenced, um, Deputy, that a lot of this is before we couldn't, now we can't. Post-COVID. Pre-COVID. We're post-COVID now. Right. Uh, right. Deputy, do you mind speaking to the mic? Sorry. We're post-COVID We're post -COVID now, so we're allowed to make... Uh, are we really post-COVID now, are we? Well... <laughs> Just, I'm sorry. <laughs> Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but no, so that, that would account for the numbers. Well, I guess the, the, the complete lockdown that we were in yeah. with the jails yes. not allowing us to arrest people uh, and bring people over there unless it was a serious violent crime. So our numbers have increased from last year due to mostly that. Okay, thank you for that. Just overall, thank you. Uh, Councilor Clement? Just briefly, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor Clement. Yes, yeah. here we go. Uh, I attended a gathering, oh, two or three weeks ago, I guess, where our sheriff spoke. And he spoke very highly of the Lewiston Police Department. He addressed the issues. Uh, I'm familiar with them, the, the lockdowns during COVID. Used to have like 250 people average in our jail. They went down to like 60 on average a day. Uh, he has opened it up, and he opened up first to Lewiston because of their professionalism and their forbearance during this period and working with him. And he had nothing but uh, good things to say about the Lewiston Police Department, not that he said bad things about others, but they are, by and large, the police in this area. There's, there's only one other department that comes anywhere near their size, but uh, he spoke very highly and he was happy to be able to pick things up again. I mean, it, it was a time when they were only taking in violent offenses, you know, violent assaults. Uh, a lot of these offenses that ordinarily would go to jail and bail out of jail, like drunk driving and stuff like that, now they give them a ticket and they're on their way. But he is opening up and he was happy to do that. And he said that he started with Lewiston because of the way they acted throughout. So he spoke very highly and I think that was a, something that I don't know that he's ever spoken to you gentlemen about that, but uh, certainly uh, it bears uh, bears repeating. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, no, and I will um, agree with uh, Councillor Clement here. I did speak with uh, Sheriff Sampson, and he uh, and he appreciated your department very much. So thank you, Councillor Harriman. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you all three for being here. 
I have a few questions, and your presentation actually answered some of them, but I've got some more mostly around community. Um, I was just wondering, I know you do the, the several different community events and programs, but are there any other community sorts of programs or community policing models that you're working on to, um, to maybe get more buy-in from the community and create something like like peer pressure, but in a in a good way from you know from people in the community to well one area that we didn't really discuss that's part of community policing uh, in, in a way and that's um, our um, officers that we have in the school on a daily basis one at the high school one at the middle school and then one that um, roams between the elementary schools um, they're there uh, on person and by design to uh, forge relationships with these kids so when we have uh, a violent crime occur uh, four or five years later these kids will go may not speak to the beat officer that they don't know but they'll go to that school resource officer that they got a relationship with way back from playing kickball at recess or having lunch with them when they were in uh, fifth fourth sixth seventh grade and even at the high school um, and, and that's proven over and over and over effective. So even though it's not on the considered the community resource officer team, the Crow team, um, it is part of the community that uh, we're, we're proud to say has worked very well over the years and still does now. There, there are some um, cities that have kicked all of the school resource officers out of the school. And to me, that's ex extreme failure on their part. Uh, we definitely solve crimes today and violent crimes due to the relationships that are formed when these young kids are hanging out with the officer that's in that school. That officer's there uh, for that reason, but they also um, issue some discipline and actually arrest some people now and then, but that's not often. Those are in extreme situations, but th their relationship with, with those kids pays off, so we, we do that on a daily basis, so just so you know. Thanks. And also, Counselor, if I could, I mean, I have in at least the Detective Bureau, I have uh, four youth detectives as well as the uh, uh, three school resource officers. And, and, you know, we're always looking for the longer term solutions, at least in investing in our youth. And we think a lot of that's key um, in reducing violence in the future. So those guys are they're always uh, looking for, you know, new innovative programs that maybe uh, you know, kind of curb some of that violence. You know, sometimes we use the older programs that have proven effective, but we're, we're always looking to do that, and they do the best they can with at least the seven officers I got working under me. So. Well, one other thing that we do, we have a lot of uh, police officers that work as coaches. Uh, Lieutenant Thies here is a coach for, for the youth um, in Lewiston as well as uh, other places. I coached youth football for four years. Um, and I still have, those kids are now uh, juniors and seniors in high school, and I still run into them today, and they come up and talk to me, and, and those are kids that I think, if they witness something, I, I believe I could go to them, because I coached them for four years. We were undefeated for four years also, just so. <laughs> threat, threat, threat. Actually, I, I coach, I coach Levitt, and we're playing Lewis in our homecoming game this Officer week. Officer Philip on <laughs> coaches too, doesn't he? Yeah, I believe he does, yeah. So th th those relationships that are forged through coaching and through athletics that our uh, officers have been doing for years also uh, bodes well uh, with the community and the kids. Some of the programs we actually do, I don't think even have a name because we do them so frequently and so often. We have, I can tell you, of several officers that I see on a regular basis that might just stop their cruiser, get out, and start playing basketball with a few children in the park. Um, I can't tell you how many of them have stopped at a lemonade stand as well, you know, uh, including myself, not to pat myself on the back, but all of those things are very important for, f to break down those barriers that might exist. And I don't think they do so much in this community as perhaps in others, you know, where, you know, I, I think we're very approachable. Um, I think our officers are all fantastic at having this community spirit and uh, it, it might not be a program with a name but it's an everyday thing and a, and a way of life for the for our offices to interact with the community thank you and then sort of related to that um, I'm curious how many how many how many of your staff uh, live in Lewiston and then um, I know recruiting is extremely difficult right now and if you have any 
programs where you try to recruit from the community, um, that, does, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're more invested in the community, but um, are there any programs like that going on? Uh, um, we do have the law enforcement program at Lewiston High School, which we, uh, we try to cultivate those kids and get them to stay within the community, go to community college here, uh, at, either at SM. CC or CMCC, um, and then keep them in the community that way. But the, that law enforcement program starts when they're a junior in high school. So the, those are people that we w would love to recruit. They're, they're local kids that we'd love to, and they're, they're familiar with the city. And uh, we do have officers here that grew up in Lewiston, and we certainly try to get as many as we can. I'd also have to look at the numbers, but I know we have several officers that do call Lewiston their home. Uh, oh, um, I just sorry. One more thing. Please um, continue, Councilor. My apologies. So um, I know you do all the, um, you know, the movie nights and the other things, and I think those are all great. I wonder if there could be even more opportunities, and not necessarily through your department, but um, like for through the rec department and the school department, just more opportunities to get kids um, to just give them more options of things to do um, to stay out of trouble and. Um, especially for education, you know, education's really one of the key things to, to give people more options in life. And it, it seems to me like if you don't have those options, you're more likely to turn to, to crime to, you know, because you don't have other options. So I, uh, I just, I, one, like, one of the things, um, I, I agree with you, the, the more things uh, these kids have to stay out of trouble there is but one thing that the city has done nothing to really do with the police department but they got them across field right at the bottom of Violet Hill that is huge and and uh, that that should keep people busy all the way till dark so that's yeah. that's that's a good thing that they've done that's at least one thing I can just think of off the top of my head yeah, and, and we're all I mean every program that we do that our officers are involved in we're always uh, you know, formalizing our ties with the community leaders, the advocates, the educators, the nonprofits. We include them in everything we do. We, I mean, we want to make sure that the, the community is part of the solution, because that's important to us, because it just shouldn't fall on us. It, is, you know, is trying to, I mean, let's say our goal is to make this a safe and, and habitable community. That's our goal. There's a lot of great men and women that work for the Lewis and Plar the police department that believe in that sincere sincerely but it's just it's got to be a community effort they got to be part of the solution and that's that's something that uh, we work for almost every day right well thank you all uh deputy higgins you mentioned a training uh so what trainings have the police been on recently or, or what uh yeah well, we had a couple get in a car accident, so they just went to uh, some training. <laughs> but that wasn't their choice. Uh, um, we have uh, various trainings that we um, send. We have a guy uh, right now that's going to be going away to supervise a school in Rhode Island. It's called the First Line. Super All our supervisors go through that. Um, so he's leaving for two weeks but uh, to go to supervise a school. Yeah. One thing that does, like I said before, not only does that train him up to be a proper uh, supervisor, but it also gives him a little bit of rest from, you know, he's on third shift, so uh, it'll probably take him a week to adjust uh, to the day, but um, it also rests his batteries. So when he comes back with, with new training and new attitude, um, it, it, he gives him the ability to keep him going. Uh, we also, verbal judo is one of the things that we send uh, every single one of our officers through with de-escalation and verbal judo. We've made a big effort to get everybody through that. Um, and we have uh, five or six people that haven't been through it out of all of our officers that are now being signed up to go through that uh, this month, actually. So that's one of the big trainings that we've uh, found it very important to send people to. Yeah, the active shooter training, we just did all of our officers went through active shooter training, and our instructors actually um, sent the Sabatis Police Department through it, as well as the Androscoggin County Sheriff's, I believe those 20 to 30 of them that went through, that we trained all of them at the same time. Um, because if, if it ever becomes an active shooter, and let's hope it never does, they may end up responding with us. So now we're all trained the same way by our guys. So if something happens in one of these places, then... Um, 
then we're all on the same sheet of music and we all so we all train together on that as a county so that, that was uh, very important so that that's just to name a few that we've done recently thank you you're welcome uh, Administrator Hunter, did you have something to add earlier? I I'm will sorry. add both to Councillor Gelinas and Councillor Scott's um, messaging regarding getting the word out and the narrative and communicating those statistics. I'm happy to say the um, new marketing director will be starting next Thursday. I will bring her along to introduce you to all of it. So we are close. We are getting close to really starting to do a variety of things to get those good narratives, the information not only on, on the city side, but also on the school side. Because I think you know they play a role not only in combating community perception, but also from an economic development perspective. Councilor Scott. Um, and also on that, so one of, the, one of the points I was trying to make is that when you're controlling that narrative, to not be afraid to say, we've had a lot of shootings. Go on your Facebook page and say, and we're doing something about it. We want to rest assured of the community. Not just an update on a press release for something that happened, but actually saying, we understand that this is happening. We're doing something about it, and this is what we're doing and how we're approaching it. I think will make a significant difference in people feeling a little bit like this is happening. And our police department's doing that. Uh, Councillor LaChapelle, do you have something? Uh, thank you. Just to address two quick, thing, quick things. Uh, one of our biggest complaints is the panhandlers all over the place. Uh, you can't walk down the street. You can't stop at any intersection. Um, that's one of the complaints that I hear from my constituents. Uh, it's addressing that uh, and how do we address that and can we address that and whether that is legislative, what is it? What is what can we do? In in conjunction to that, uh, you mentioned that there's legislative concerns that you have. Can you put that together and articulate that? We have an election in November. Whether people win or lose, it doesn't matter. This is a council should be advocating for the Lewiston Police Department, whoever is there, whoever our representatives are from Lewiston, that we would like to pursue that to assist you. If you can give us some kind of guidance, what your your concerns are, in terms of panhandling, it's really not in of in and of itself illegal for somebody to stand on the sidewalk with a sign to asking for money, um, provided that they're not uh, obstructing a public way. So if they're you know preventing passage by you know another pedestrian, certainly we can move them along or you know, arrest them if need be for obstructing a public way. But if they're merely just standing there with a sign saying anything will help, there's really nothing we can do to move them along provided that they're not blocking the sideway or being aggressive in their demands. We can arrest, the, there's ordinances in the books that say aggressive panhandling that we can certainly take action for. But merely being polite and asking for anything that help, you know, any, any money or anything is, is nothing that we can take any action for, unfortunately. Well, uh, thank you uh, all for being here, and uh, congratulations uh, for being fire at the fitness court. <laughs> no, I still love you, fire department. Um, anything else from either of you three? No, but thank you very much, all of you, for your support of the police department. We do appreciate that. Thank you. Please tell your um, agency thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, Administrator Hunter, we're heading into uh, executive yep, session. We have a special meeting to go into executive session pursuant to MRSA Title I, Section 405-6A to discuss a personnel matter. May I have a motion? Uh, Councillor uh, Clement, followed by Councillor Pease. And uh, please call the vote. Or all those, all all those in favor. In favor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.